Welcome to the two minute warning global interview series where we take a rapid fire at what is next and most importantly what should be next in the global energy transition. My name is Michelle Meinecke, I'm the director of the energy transition dialogues at Gulf Intelligence and with me today I'm very glad to say is Alison Anderson Book, she is the vice president of the energy transition at Baker Hughes. Hi Alison. Hi, how are you? I'm very well, how are you? I'm, I'm good. Happy Monday to everybody in whatever time zone they're in. Indeed. <laughs> For some, it will very, very quickly be pushing into the week. Right. Let's crack on with a, quite a quite a broad broad strokes question. So maximizing the triple bottom line, key focus for the 21st century for, for all our benefits, of course, people, planet, profit. Do you think that we're on track? Where would you place the marker of progress so far for the energy industry? Well, you know, at Baker Hughes, we actually think about people, planet, and principles. But if you have all three lined up, you get to the profitability in a sustainable way. And so, I, you know, I think that the journey in terms of, of that sort of framework and rubric is, is just starting for a lot of companies. And so, so I'd say we've got to give it a little bit of time so that we can really ensure that, that people are on track. But the, you know, if you undertake that framework, right? you have this opportunity to really focus on how to be profitable, but delivering results in a very sustainable way, both in terms of how you operate and then a, a business model that, that takes into account um, risk mitigation so that you can use your sustainability as a way to buffer against risk. And I think that's a lot of where the focus is today when you think about um, ESG more generally speaking. And you just mentioned time then, of course, part of this broader climate conversation is this booming TikTok of the climate clock and the fact that time is is one of the ingredients we just simply don't have very much of anymore uh, when it comes to this by 2050 and some would argue we've already run out and, and the goals by 2050 are, are long gone mm -hmm. already. How can companies find that balance between yes they have to move very very fast we're obviously in much broader societal pressure legal pressures as we recently saw with Shell in the courts and we've had many other examples in the last year of big energy big oil and gas coming under pressure. How can we find a balance between moving fast and the pressure points there, but as you say, doing it properly as well, so that there's not this expense of backtracking later in the 2020s, 2030s, 2040s, and so on. How to find that balance? You know, that's a really excellent question because there was a, a sort of fever after 2019, right? And so, so early on, we, we made a, uh, we were one of the first net zero uh, pledges for our operations. And you know, you go into that thinking, yeah, we can do this. This is very contained, right? A lot of companies got the fever and maybe haven't done enough of the back, uh, the back work, right? And so I think that you've got you've got to be very nimble. This is moving very fast, faster than I've ever seen sustainability take off. The um, the key is that you spend time. Maybe you run things in parallel. Right, you don't think about let's sequence this and this, but you can do some basic. I would call it the eighty percent rule, where you get to eighty percent, and then you think, okay, this forms decision making, right? So, so there's the the eighty percent that we've got to think about is is first measure, right, and verify what you have, and then think how can we how can we actually handle say emissions in this case, right? Can can we reduce things to to a certain level, but You've got to think about your how you're measuring, you know, emissions. If we're talking about emissions, and mm -hmm. then think about what reasonable goals are, right? And start work right now. And so, so there's something that I talk about a lot, and I'll, I'll drop this in as, as quickly as I can, and that's be here right now, right? Mm -hmm. Commit. If you've made your commitment to net zero or any other part of sustainability, whether it's your diversity, equity, inclusion, or, or what have you. You've got to start the action now. The temptation mm -hmm. is that people think, oh, I've got like, you know, 20, 25 years, and that seems like it's forever away. No, no, I'm a geologist. That's like a that's like a blink of an eye in geologic time, right? We've got to think about what we can commit to right now in our the smallest actions, right? There is no action too small. And so start with energy efficiency. You know, get your employees to really think about how they're empowered to make change on your journey, right? So you make your commitment, you start your action, even if it's small, you continue to measure, and, and then you keep reassessing annually. 
Indeed, every single chip at that block of stone will get you closer to the beautiful statue underneath of sustainability. <laughs> you've, just got, you've just got to start chipping away, even, even on these lower hanging fruits. And arguably every company can make those lower hanging fruits when it comes to small changes in their talent pool, small changes in the way their buildings operate and so on by the end of this year, if they haven't already, though I know a lot of companies are, are certainly getting a move on. I also just want to talk about the dual strategy that you have in terms of um, to implement efficiency measures today while investing in the energy solutions for the future, which is very much what you just discussed. You know, let's run in parallel. We don't need to wait till we have 100% of this to move on to the next stepping stone. Let's run them side by side. How efficient are you finding that, that process so far? Well, you know, we made our commitment in 2019 and, and then there's this sort of period of, you know, let's look at what we've committed to and how do we get there in a very deliberate way but with the biggest impact with the least amount of inquire, acquired cost, right? Mm -hmm. I think that there is this uh, view that um, mitigating carbon um, is going to be really, really expensive. You know, if you, if you stage it in the right way and you really look at and, and analyze the, uh, the, the technology and the behaviors of people that you have available today, you can go pretty far pretty quickly. So we just published our CR report uh, for 2020. And in there, I'd point people to a couple things. And getting back to the dual strategy, you know, we, we took a look at um, nine building blocks that are a great framework for how you get to net zero as a company. And if people want to learn a little bit more of that, about that, we won't have time here today. But there are there are a series of, of things that you need to enable success. Everything from a very robust stakeholder engagement, policy engagement, et cetera, right? But the bottom line is you've got to think about how you're going to operate, operationalize your efforts on that. You've got to think about uh, having the, the scope three even, right? And so we, we talk a lot about scope one and two, but supply chains become very material and very important, okay? Wow, you get a handle on your supply chain, you can make really meaningful cuts very quickly. And almost anything can change. Yep. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we, uh, we kind of outlined the levers we're going to pull right away in that report. And so, so since we're cons time constrained here, uh, I'll sort of let that go. But the, um, uh, there is a lot that can be done uh, right now. And let me point out one for anybody who's listening from the, from the more producer side of the yeah. shop is that, you know, in the past year or so, we've really embraced remote operations. That's something that, that we think about as both uh, using it for our operations and also as a service to customers. That alone, we have we've had some pilots in the Middle East. Actually, we we were we deployed more of that in the past year, and, and I would say that was very that was a very successful endeavor. I mean, anytime you cannot send somebody out to the rig, you save a lot of missions. Uh, mm -hmm. It just in in and the travel talent time. time as well. The, the time that person is traveling, they're not thinking, they're not being creative as well. That's right. That's right. It, all these things take those. Take those in aggregate. What seems like a really small action today can can be big returns later. And so I'm really excited to see remote remote operations really continuing going forward. And just to I mean, of course, technology has made those remote operations possible. And there's also what's making creating those carbon footprints, which you mentioned just a, just a while ago, viable as well. Do you think that there's enough? understanding in the broader market, not, not within Baker Hughes, but in the broader market about what a carbon footprint means, because it's often thrown around as a buzz term and, and, and truly getting to the, the, the complexities of it, of what that truly involves and, and the effort that it's going to take to get there and the, the, cha the, the huge shift in actual thinking before you even get to the operational changes, the way we think, all of us, of course, that some doesn't always feel like it's the stone hasn't quite dropped just yet. Is that something you feel as well? Do you find that? Yeah, I think that people are only starting to realize in some cases what they've committed to and, and depending on the structure of their company. Like we, we have a pretty good handle of Baker Hughes. Like this is a very achievable goal actually. The, um, uh, when, you, when I look at the landscape cross-sectorally, even outside of oil and gas, we can learn a lot from, from their other peers. But I do see a lot of companies because they want to signal their commitment, they're going and they're using offsets and, and such. Whereas we commit to making the deepest cuts the fastest so that you, you have an opportunity to, to cut emissions, cut, you know, maybe reduce some costs and increase some efficiencies in how you operate, right? And mm -hmm. so, 
so you know the rest the rest of the universe i really think people are still sort of coming to terms and and i appreciate the companies who are being so deliberate that they're 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 really laying out a slower uh case but perhaps they'll be the more successful i will say so the the, yeah 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 it's it's a slow and steady one's the race sometimes mm -hmm. now you know it's good to remember that uh, the climate, climate science of today, you know, it used to be we thought about uh, the changes you make today have a ripple effect maybe 100 years from now, but, but studies within the past year have actually said on a local scale it's decadal. So the choices that we make, you know, so moving faster has its advantages and that we can actually address climate change faster. But back to your question of, um, you know, do people fully understand it yet? I would say no, and there are a lot of there's a lot of jargon and buzzwords that are out there. But when you fully understand what what you're committing to, you get very serious quickly uh, in talking about the governance from boards and the other that principles part of people plan and principles that we look mm -hmm. at, and making sure that everybody is aware of what you've committed to and what it means to your business because you still want to keep your margins, right? You still want to grow as a company. And, and you don't and that, have and it, to... that in itself has societal benefits as well. So it's not about uh, you know driving companies into the ground to make them green. Uh, that's that right. That's right. And so you don't have to be driven into the ground. That's the great yeah. news, right? And so there's so much that can be done today that that leverages uh, you know really maintaining your business today, but doing it in a way that that really can tackle um, the overall sustainability of your company in a smart way. From a technology point of view, for those companies that aren't as adept in this space, both on sustainability and digitalization, what sorts of technologies would you recommend to them or do you think would be beneficial to them to use to start doing those low hanging fruits when it comes to monitoring, verifying and accounting their, their carbon footprint? So not, not necessarily that they need to start being extremely sophisticated and like like you said as well so it's, it's slow and steady for some but just so they can get started what what sort of technologies would you advise yeah you know I, there there are um a lot of opportunities for people today especially if you're in classic EMP company and and so we have everything from you know flare optimization that will help reduce um you know mm. the, it'll help combust more so that it converts methane to co2 we have methane detection technology uh as a part of our um yeah i would say our measuring and verification services and that's mm. through through a product line called avitas and so so there's a lot just on the the sensing and being able to get the upfront assessment right there are the pieces that you can do on the mitigation side right away. I mean, whether it's a shift from something like a turbine 20 years old that, that maybe is less efficient to one that's very sophisticated. We've got some pretty sophisticated, leaner, more, more efficient in terms of their combustion as well. And so, so you can take the emissions down just by upgrading you know, the equipment. There are other pieces in, in this. I love the turbine space because where we're headed very much in the frontier space is shifting then to a hydrogen blend turbine or potentially a fully hydrogen turbine. You know, you've got these sort of discrete just, things. Just on that, you did a project with SNAM, didn't you? Uh, yep. Italy SNAM, and it was testing the world's first hybrid hydrogen turbine designed for a gas work network, and that was last year. Has, yeah. has there been any updates on that? It's an exciting project. Has there been any updates on, on, on what's going on? Well, we continue to work on it. And so, so you know, in terms of the update, nothing that I think I'm, I'm ready to be the first public first person from our company to talk about publicly but but that work is very much continuing i mean there's there's a as we as we sort of march down the road and get to some something more of a hydrogen based um mm -hmm. world potentially i mean that potential is so great I, there's a lot we can do there and then you start to think about things like carbon capture and storage as a part of a bigger solution set and system and that's an area that we've been uh really focused on on investments in particularly you read about our our um three the carbon compact carbon capture acquisition that we had but we have some other pieces i think you, you may have seen uh, we had a uh, electric kia there's some 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 discrete moves that we're trying to really build that portfolio as a bigger solution system right it's and not, so it's, it's never really met its potential ccs it's, it's in terms of 
the, the forecast for growth, it's never it's never really kept up with those, has it? It's often mentioned as is this good solution for for the market, but um, the investment behind it is lagging or, ha or has historically lagged quite a bit. Could, yeah, could I think there's a lot more investment coming, right? And so you you we've always seen the major investment because there's so many challenges behind both hydrogen and CCS, right? Mm -hmm. And it's if you go in with your eyes open and you think about this as a journey that's that's really you're investing today for you know changes, part of that's coupled with policy, right? Mm -hmm. And so so on the policy side, you've got to really take out um, a market disablers things that that are related to if it, we're talking about the storage of co2 like how do you you know how do you indemnify sites that piece of it so there's still some big policy pieces that need to be uh, really transformed into the enabling space versus currently i think it's kind of viewed as disabling but but where we are focused right now is really on the technology piece that so you can bring the price of it down right same thing on hydrogen hydrogen is is limited maybe with infrastructure and some other things. But again, you get the pricing right and governments have signaled across the world that, that they are very interested in that kind of a future, right? Very and interested. I mean- Very interested. Almost huge, shouted it from huge the rooftop. public investment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, you know, we're there trying to also think about how we can really leverage that that bigger public investment as well. And so, so when I think about where we're headed, you know, there's there's some IEA stats that say we've got about you know 30 or 40 percent of the tech today that that we need to tackle that, and so so that's a small number when you think about the bigger challenge of climate change. And so I think we'll still see in the coming decades some leapfrogging kinds of, of technologies. And so we are focused in looking at early tech technology readiness levels as well as more mature uh, areas and some organic plays that we have within our portfolio of Baker Hughes. And there are so many technologies as well in, in, in those IEA stats that, that you're referring to that are available but haven't been commercialized. So the, the innovation is there, but it is about get, rolling out and getting it commercialized. And Alison, thank you so much for joining joining us. We've covered quite a broad broad sphere and uh, hopefully we can get together again talk about those cbams and also talk about hydrogen a lot more because it is a whole new world and it's a very very exciting one so thank you very Excellent. much thanks for having me thank you